Let me know if this cartoon rings at all true for you. Can I move this? Do you mind? It must, because I'm hearing giggling. OK, so we have a confession to make. This presentation was born out of an extremely frustrating semester that we had. In the Pathway program, our students are typically divided um, by semester, loosely, under 31, over 31. We love our over 31 grandmas. They're so much fun. Our under 31s. <laughs> <laughs> um, our under 31 class has a tendency to make us a little bit crazy. And we both had, at the same time, such an excruciatingly frustrating semester trying to engage these younger students, trying to get them to participate, to read our notes and our emails. Um, and because were wise and wonderful, we decided instead of just sitting around complaining about them, which we did a large measure of originally, lots of texting, what is wrong with them? We, we decided that we wanted to actually look into this and see if we could identify problems and find solutions. So this presentation was a result, really, of that conversation, the most productive result of that conversation, I have to say. <coughs> so. Um, I'm going to, for starters, I'm going to use the term millennials. I know that's kind of a contentious term, um, and it has a lot of different definitions. We're, we're loosely talking about um, kids who were born uh, mostly in the early part of the 80s. They started entering college right around the turn of the millennium, okay? Which is, it turns out, um, when the rest of um, academia started noticing some weird things about this incoming group of students right around 2000. We weren't alone. When we started digging into the research, um, we were relieved to discover that it wasn't just our students, it wasn't just this crazy semester, um, but there is actually, truthfully, a body of literature that's starting to really grow around millennials in education and how to, how to deal with them, how not to go crazy dealing with them. Um, so, uh, really quickly, because we're timing ourselves here, um, I want to, uh, I'm not going to ask the question, I'm just going to have you shout some things out. There are some legitimate major cultural differences that have affected these students. Anything you can think of, again, you don't even have to raise hands, just shout out some differences, some things that have happened in the last couple of decades. Say again? Liberal educators, okay, what did you say? Social media, absolutely. How about the internet generally, right? These kids, like I remember my senior year of high school when we first got email. These kids have never known education without digital media ever, okay? Anything else? What else can you think of? Smartphones, Smartphones. yeah, right? What else? Text language. Text language, of course. They don't like to read. They don't like to read. Oh, we're going to talk about that specifically. <laughs> Entitlement. So one of the um, points that we found, probably the three biggest that we found were the internet and digital technology generally, everything that that includes. Um, this particular kind of parenting and education philosophy that became popular really at the end of the 60s, but sort of bloomed in the late 80s and early 90s, that was all about, um, th it's really referred to as the self-esteem movement, right? It's all about how the students feel, um, equal outcomes, things like that, that have made it so they sort of passed all the way through school without maybe learning what we need them to have learned before they get here. And the third, and this one is interesting, is um, the economy. This is obviously not the worst economy that students have entered college in, but this is a unique confluence of factors. This is the first generation raised with the expectation that they will go to college. And simultaneously, no expectation whatsoever that college is going to help them get into the workforce. So that has made for a, a group that is unwilling to take financial risks. They view education strictly as a commodity. <clears throat> there are some really odd things going on. Obviously, there are problems all over the place here, right? But the problem that we want to address has less to do with fixing them and more to do with changing our perspective. Let me read you just one quotation uh, from one, one of the researchers we found. He said, it will surely be remarked that never was the misfit between professors' favored styles of teaching and the actual skills and predilections brought to learning by the young so great or so rapidly increasing. He says there is such a disconnect between how we teach and how these particular students learn, and it's only getting worse. So what we want to do is to try and understand what makes these students different and how we can address those differences in order to help them have a better experience with education. All right, go. Okay, so, I don't know if my mic's working. Here we go. So what we've done is we've done extensive research that they are still highly validated. <laughs> 
What? It's like my kids, right? <laughs> I decide to add this at the bottom where I ask them a series of questions and ask them to respond. So I ask them to confirm they've received the message. I ask them, what do you want to learn this semester? What can I teach you? I ask them to share information about themselves that I feel will help me be able to meet their unique needs so they feel like I'm partnering with them as their educator. And then I ask them just to share with me a little bit about themselves, good news.
pages. So this is kind of um, something that I do, is right here at the bottom when I do my prompt thread, I just say in addition to answering the question above, I would love it if you would follow up with these types of a question. And they do. Most of them do. By the end of the semester, I have about 75 to 70 students actively facilitating their own discussion of this in a process that we put in place. Um, another thing you can do is highlight assignments or facets of the course where the greatest autonomy is given. Um, so, for example, my students hated in my English 106 class that the critical thinking paper couldn't help them in selecting one of the six topics. They're always like, I don't want to write about any of these topics. I want to write about what I want to write about. But I'm always quick to point out that this is just preparation for the next paper, the submission paper, where they're going to be able to pick whatever topic they want. So I point them to, but this would be kind of, it would be amazing because you're going to be able to do that in the creative. And they're like, oh, okay. Um, finally, something that I do is I like to add phrases at the bottom of my feedback where I say, let me know if you have any questions. So instead of it being, here is your grade, I say, this is what I gave you. I give them my feedback. Please contact me if you all have any questions about it. So again, I'm inviting that dialogue for them. And then something else you can do is allow rewrites and resubmissions for select assignments if you want them to fill up their own paper. All right. Oh, I'm going to go back one. Sorry. There we go. Oh, spoiled the surprise. The next one is, uh, let's go to it. The Probably the most explicitly negative ones. We're just going to say it and get it right out of the way, right? Um, what, what we are finding is that this group is um, rather woefully unprepared <laughs> for uh, the rigors of college. How do we know that um, besides our own uh, experience? Um, let's see, a couple quick statistics. The National Assessment of Education's progress, Educational Progress, this is they call it the nation's report card. Okay, back in 2015, they said only one third of seniors that they had studied were prepared for college level coursework, specifically in reading and math. Um, the reading, in fact, had hit a record low that year, and the um, person who, the researcher who heads up this study, says that they've seen a steady decline, and it doesn't show any signs of recovering, at least not yet. Um, I've got a couple of just totally frightening um, charts and things like that. Uh, the percentage of students who have to take remedial courses once they um, get to college. Uh, another one. This one's harder to read, and I apologize for that. Essentially, what it's saying is how many recent high school student grads were adequately prepared in this area. So it's asking college professors about the preparation level of their students, and the big orange is less than half. They were less less than half of them were prepared in these uh, different areas. <coughs> Um, here's another one. There was a report that found that 47% or almost half of all American high school students uh, completed neither a college nor a career-ready course of study. There's like an outlined course. Um, they have to take this many classes, this much math, this much English, and half of them had not um, taken what they needed to be prepared for college. Um, this doesn't show up in your courses, right? You guys have never dealt with unprepared students. What have you seen? How have you noticed that your students are unprepared for the level of study. Yeah? Bad writing. bad writing, what? I teach English, I never see bad writing. Just kidding. Opinion without support, exactly, yeah. This is the thing I think that scares me the most. Obviously, I don't expect them to be expert writers when they come to English 106 in Pathway, which is what I teach. So I know that I'm going to be working with them on their writing skills. What I did not realize when I started was that I would have to teach them how to be college students. They need to know how to study, which they don't. They don't know how to meet deadlines. They don't know how to receive feedback without sort of crumpling. Um, <coughs> there are some very basic things that we uh, feel like I, we need to work on. Um, let me read you part of the BYUI mission, because it's easy for me especially to get frustrated with this. My dad, I have to tell you, my dad is an English teacher at a community college, and we live um, very close to each other. And so my poor husband and wife have to listen to my dad and I complaining about our English students all the time, that they don't know how to do this, and they always turn in papers late, and they're asking for extension, blah, blah, blah. So it's easy to get grumpy about these kinds of students, but I was struck when I read this line. Part of our mission is, Preparing students for lifelong learning, for employment, and for their role as citizens and parents. Preparing students for learning. I am not 
to assume that they are learning experts when they come to me. It's part of my job. It's written there that I am supposed to teach them how to be learners. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Keep with it. Stick with it. Yeah. Right. The test. Right. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Oh, my word. Mm hmm. Right, right, exactly. <laughs> or calendar. And we're going to talk actually a little bit later about how much they read and don't read. Last one, yeah. Right. Yes. Right. Right. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about things that we can do. Um, again, this is according. To, this was so interesting to read what others have found effective according to these big studies, um, and it, you know, in part kind of validated what we had been doing. In part, sort of changed the direction of some things that we had been doing. One of the first ones was let them fail early. I'm going to say something like sacrilegious here. I have a no late work policy in my English class. I do not accept late work. OK, but really, I kind of do. But I never do at the beginning of class, because if I let them turn in Major, major um, principle here. One researcher says instructors should present consequences sooner and they put that in quotation marks. Them, <coughs> excuse me, um, uh, rework assignments or um, we, I can't give makeup work or anything like that, but if they feel that crisis, that pinch, that, oh my goodness, I actually am going to have to do something early in the semester, then it's motivating for them, hopefully, um, later in the semester. There was a hand here. Yes? Yes, it's true. Going to exactly where it is. Feel that pain. Have some leeway, some latitude in terms of when you accept late assignments and what kind of makeup work you can do. I would encourage you to, um, like I said, let let that kind of um, strictness happen early, and then show mercy later in the course. Yes. Do I consider advertising Mm-hmm. That's a great idea. That's a great idea. Yes? It's hard for me because I did not read it in the form I did it specifically on the English one. Mm -hmm. So the one time instruction that from now on is good. Just to make it clear that in week one, yeah. these learners are coming to them. And that's something that we could absolutely do. I'm teaching GS120 in the fall, and I like this idea. We, yes, we are supposed to accept late work for the first two weeks, but we don't have to tell the students that, right? That we can, like Tori said, we can advertise that kind of strictness, but when we make exceptions, make it clear to the student that this is a one-time thing. Forgive me, I'm going to move on to the next one. Ah. Um, emphasize rubrics. We all have rubrics that we work with um, that uh, tells the student precisely what is expected of them. I use them before and after assignments. I use it um, when I'm 
preparing the students for the assignment, I make it absolutely clear this is how I will be grading you. I tell them you can essentially self-grade these papers. So the rubric is front and center all the time. And then um, in grading them, I give them feedback according to the categories in the rubric. So that is all encompassing. Um, Reward good study habits um, when they read the material, when they post early, things like that. Draw special attention to um, the way that they're doing a good job there. And this last one is my favorite. Um, sneak in study habit instruction as you can. Um, something that I got from a very smart instructor at one point um, who talks about the growth mindset in her class. She teaches English, but she talks about it there. So I've snuck. <coughs> Um, some of this into my weekly notes or into, um, yeah, some of the discussions that we, we have uh, in the discussion boards and get them thinking about different ways to think and different ways to learn. This doesn't have explicitly to do with English 106, but it's part of my responsibility to teach them how to be learners, and that's one of the things we do. Um, okay, I'm going to hand it over to you because we're running late. Wait, you bet. Yep. Okay, my mic wasn't working, so now you're going to see me like try to like triple hand everything here. <laughs> okay, so the next area that we're going to go over is the fact that millennials need context and justification. They need real life application. Um, some of the research out there um, states that members of this generation aim to please as long as it promises to advance their goals. Um, to raise a family, get a job, things like that. The educational attainment goals of millennials are the highest ever surveyed. So they're very optimistic about what they're wanting out of their life. How sometimes, have you noticed, too optimistic? Too <laughs> optimistic sometimes about what, what they want to achieve in their lives. Um, they want to get education. They want to get degrees that actually exceed the expectation of their job because they want to be successful. Um, according to a study that was done um, by Forbes, 68% of recent graduates identified good opportunities for growth and development as their top professional priority. Um, most people in the millennial group are hungry and want to advance, and they even go so far as to say that if you do not provide development, it is like a slap in the face to millennials. That is how much they value development opportunities and how much we need to give them context. So. What difficulties might this present for you as an instructor if they want to know that everything they're learning is going to get them a high paying job and make them wildly successful? How does this complicate things for us? I think, I mean, just as a, I'm a math teacher, so uh -huh. I need context for this math equation. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. When am I ever going to use this? I need context for math, <laughs> always. I think that's really important. Yeah. Yes. Right. Yes. Growth mindset, mm -hmm. yes. Like, you have to be able to develop a mindset when you get there. Mm -hmm. A mindset is how you are raised. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. A mindset that you use to be able to do these skills on your other job skills. Mm -hmm. No, no, absolutely, absolutely. So the main thing that I was thinking about is some of these things might not be explicit in our courses. Some of our curriculum designers might not integrate the fact that every single assignment they're doing, like the love letter in my <laughs> class, is going to help them <laughs> to develop and grow into someone who's going to get the high paying job that they're wanting. My students want to know what the love letter is going to do for them. And so that is a really, really hard outcome sometimes that we need to work with in our course. So what can be done about it? Um, the first thing, um, I think, is we need to make sure that we give context to our courses in general. This is, again, supported by the BYU-Idaho learning model. I'm going to share the same quote that Stacy actually did. Listen to this. Preparing students for lifelong learning, for employment, and for their roles as citizens and parents. So basically, in our whole learning model and mission of BYUI, we're giving context to what our entire educational experience that we're offering them is supposed to be doing. We're supposed to be preparing them for lifelong learning, employment, and their roles as citizens and parents. It's actually our job here as instructors at BYU-Idaho. And interestingly enough, 
um, some of the descriptions that I found um, in the BYU-Idaho um, homepage and curriculum states that for most college students, general education courses are considered a chore, something to soldier through and check off their list before they can move on to more interesting classes associated with their majors. This is not the case at BYU-Idaho, where general education courses have been completely redesigned. Known as foundations, these innovative classes raise the quality of every student's experience experience by providing a stronger basis for learning to build upon. So again, <laughs> just the beauty and really the prophecy behind the, the learning model was shocking to me in catering to millennials. So how can we do this though? What can we do? Whoa. It's okay. Ooh, okay. Um, announcements. Um, here's an example of something I do in my announcements. I try to give context to assignments. So there's something that they have to write called a personal essay. And no one seems to understand why we have to write this assignment, and they don't understand the idea of the personal essay and what this has to do with anything. So something that I try to do is I bring in things like movies. So I use the example of the movie Rudy to show them how every good movie that they've watched, every good book that they've read, employs the idea of a universal theme or thesis. Why is it that we are like cheering with Rudy and crying <laughs> at the end of the movie, feeling like I wanna go to Notre Dame? <laughs> I do, and I wanna play football and be like Rudy. It's because of the universal theme that's implemented in there and it's valuable for them to be able to identify that in, in, in writing or in movies or in anything. Um, something else I do is try to integrate it on the discussion board. Um, giving context to things. So this is a, a question for everyone that I posted. Angie had some thoughts about something, and I decided to follow up some of her thoughts with a question for everyone by trying to take it more global. So showing them that the reading assignment that they're reading has everything to do with things going on in their own life. So how can we overcome our tendency to care about what people think about us? Um, they are reading the Ophelia syndrome and other reading assignments like that that might seem like it's just something cool they're reading for the course, but I'm trying to show them how this is something our society is suffering from in general and how they can overcome it. Um, another thing is I try to do it in feedback. Um, something that I am very, very cognizant of when I'm giving feedback is I like to feed forward. I don't know if you've ever heard that, but I don't just like to comment on the assignment and how well they did on this assignment and gold star for you. I like to show them either what they did really well that's going to serve them really well on a future assignment or something that's coming up on the horizon that they're struggling with. Like for this critical thinking paper, for example, telling them, okay, this thing that you're struggling with right here is going to become a huge part of your grade on the next paper. So I want you to really, really work on this so that you have it all in order for this next paper. Yes? Yeah. Uh-huh. Mm. Yes. That's a great That's idea. That's awesome. Yeah. No, I think that's fabulous. That's absolutely fabulous. Um, also, in your personal exchanges um, with them, giving them context, I'm just going to really briefly share a story. I taught an English 450 class. It was a really, really hard class to teach. Um, and I had a lot of millennials in it that were about to graduate. And I was so sad because when I read the final capstone learning report from this one student in English 450, um, they were asked to just comment on their overall experience at BYU-Idaho. And she was a really good student. I never would have thought that she had such negative feelings about her experience um, pre my course at BYU-Idaho. She said, I do not understand why BYU-Idaho runs the university the way they do. I go into classes, it feels like it's anarchy. They're constantly asking me to take charge of my own education. They're constantly asking me to run discussions, to talk to people, to do group projects. And I don't understand why can't I just go there and you know, basically be a receptacle of information that the professor delivers to me. I could get my stuff and move on. And I was like, Learning model? Does she not know the learning model? And maybe it wasn't executed perfectly um, in all the classes we're working on it, right? But I, I thought, okay, I could either just issue a grade and say thanks for this report and ignore it, or I could email her because I wanted her to not remember BYU-Idaho the way she was remembering it. So I decided to take a chance, <laughs> and I emailed her, and I said, her name 
I won't say her name. <laughs> but I just said to her, I said, you know what? I read your learning report, and I saw that you weren't really happy about your experience at BYU-Idaho. And maybe that is the, I don't know where that sound's coming from. Don't either. There's a person. I'll figure it out. Ghost of Christmas past. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Someone's going, cut, cut. No, Okay. So I emailed her and I said, but I just don't want you to remember BYU-Idaho this way. Maybe your experience wasn't perfect. Maybe your professors were just starting to learn to grasp the learning model and what they were trying to do. But let me tell you something. I was educated at BYU-Idaho. I went through this program. I am the product of the learning model at BYU-Idaho. And I can tell you that I went through, I experienced the same frustration of you, of having to basically take charge of my education and always be on my toes, always knowing my professor is going to make me talk and think and do things that are really uncomfortable for me. But I went on to share with her some of the foundational addresses. I shared quotes with her from the learning model and showed her that that's what it was meant to do. And then I went on to bear my testimony to her that when I went to graduate school after being a BYU-Idaho student here, that I was so overprepared compared to my peers, which was shocking. I mean, I knew BYU-Idaho was a great school and I loved it, but I had no idea how the learning model prepared me for the academic rigor and the type of work I would be doing in graduate school. And I told her that. And she automatically emailed me back and said, wow. I had no idea that that's what BYU-Idaho was trying to get me to do. I wish I had had that context when I had started the program. They love context. And it completely altered her perspective of her BYU-Idaho experience. Didn't erase the bad memories, but it made her think about it differently. So I just encourage you to uh, give context as much as possible. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, this one might be one of the most obvious uh, differences between this particular group and previous groups. Um, did I include that slide? I did. Have you guys seen things like this in your life, right? Have you ever watched a five-year-old with an iPad? They are native to ideas like hardware and software or clicking or swiping. Um, my, I have passcodes on all my um, media because my little ones figure out very quickly that they can do In fact, they can access the camera they figured out without my passcode. Oh my gosh, it's a disaster. <laughs> I have a whole bunch of statistics here that I'm not going to read you all, um, uh, but a couple of notes. Um, this is obviously, maybe not obviously, the group who is experiencing the heaviest media consumption of any other generation. They're used to rapidly changing screens. They're used to nonlinear thinking. It's the hyperlink process rather than beginning to end, right? They're um, used to immediate information, um, and they're used to multitasking, right? Having a lot of different screens and tabs and things open going on all at the same time. I will read you this one. While working, they tend to have multiple computer applications open, leading to an average of 23 combined hours spent dur during a normal work day across these various functions. So if they add up all the time on Facebook, all the time on Twitter, all the time on Snapchat and put it together, it comes up to almost a full day, right? <coughs> but they're not, they're not on it 23 hours a day. They're just doing so many different things at a time which is crazy. Um, researchers don't yet know entirely how this is affecting the brains of this generation. Um, the research is kind of all over the place. There was one terrifying experiment that we read about where they took um, two groups of mice, right, a control group, um, put it into a, the mice into a maze and timed them to see how fast they learned to navigate the maze. Exposed the second group to a series of rapidly changing images on a screen and then gave them the same task, and it took them far longer to learn to navigate the maze. And the result, of course, they're saying these are mice, they're not people, but it looks like it slows down certain processes. Um, at the very least, what we know is that it has led to kind of an explosion of different learning styles. Um, more, uh, they call it twitch speed or game speed. They want to see things faster. Parallel processing, which is another way to say multitasking. Um, hyperlinking through materials. Um, fantasy and play incorporated into work. This is from gaming, right? All sorts of, <coughs> of different approaches to learning. Can't, have you found, so we all teach online, right? Technology is kind of inherent in what we're doing. Have you found their, um, sort of native technological capacity to be a stumbling block in any way in your courses? Yes? Mm -hmm. 
Right, right. Yeah. Wow. Right. Oh, that's interesting. Yep. Oh. <laughs> Interesting. Interesting. Really good point. Yeah. <laughs> that is probably my biggest frustration is that these students are so used Oh, sorry, uh, they won't read. They won't read blocks of text. They're so used to quick um, and compact bites of information that they can process immediately that they have a hard time, and I don't think they're impatient. I think they truly have a hard time reading through whole blocks of text. So that means our emails and things like that. Yeah. Obviously. Oh, right, right. Right, yes. Yes, and relatedly, if I don't answer their question, like the minute they hit send on that text, then it's like I've malfunctioned, right? I'm, not, I'm glitchy and I'm not working because I am not as immediate as their technology is supposed to be. Good. Um, when Sarah and I were brainstorming this, we were also talking about um, unfocused work. Like, I can tell when they, you know, were writing an essay and on Snapchat at the same time because it just, you know, it's not there. Um, one of the biggest reasons that this is a problem, <laughs> sometimes, I shouldn't say all the time, sometimes, has to do with their level of comfort with the technology versus my level of comfort with the technology. Um, the instructor standard number five is the one that I look to when I think about this that we're supposed to be seeking development opportunities, increased proficiency in our disciplines, in teaching practice, and in mastering course tools. As I was looking over this, I realized that it's, it's really on me to figure out how to use technology the way that they use it so that I can engage them kind of on their own terms, if that makes sense. Um, I do want to ask, I've got a couple of ideas here of things that we can do, um, but I do also want to open it up. One of the things that we try to do is sort of change it up, especially in our instructor notes, provide multiple access points, right? Not just text, but we want there to be um, graphics or videos or screencasts or sometimes even just bullet points and white space, right? That helps. <coughs> um, Hyperlink. I hyperlink everything in my course. Anytime I make reference to anything else in the course, I put a link there for it. Um, highlighting important information. Oh, I'm going to actually use Sarah's little thing here. I love, this is the um, clip that she used earlier. I like that she uses color, she uses bolding, she uses nice spaces, a list, things like that to make accessing the information a little bit more easily. Um, but I do want to ask, what are some things that you have done, and quickly, I'm so sorry, we're running out of time, to use technology to help instead of kind of hold back your students? Yeah. Great. Right. Excellent. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. They're stuck, right. And Karen, I like the idea of interactive anything, interactive notes, interactive emails, inter yeah, exactly. Over here. Mm. Yeah.
Good. Good. Right. Excellent. And I want to point out here, and I'm sorry we don't have time for more discussion because I really love hearing your ideas about how to use technology. Um, we are pretty blessed here in terms of the tech resources that we have. Between, I saw that we're changing over from Adobe Connect to something else, but that other something is cool. All the different kinds of screencast um, abilities that we have, the, the resource banks that we have, there's a lot, a lot of technology. And I know that there are a lot of instructors who have gone out and sought their own solutions to the problems. Not only that, Sarah had mentioned when we were talking about this earlier, that some of her students will come up with creative uses of technology in her classes. And this goes back to this idea of autonomy and creativity, that if we encourage them to use the technology in ways that increase their learning, in ways that build community maybe, Objectives. And with assignment objectives in mind, yeah, th that's a great way to reach them, again, on their own terms. Last one. Okay, I am going to skip over a lot of the pedagogy because I want to get right to the, right to the heart of it. Um, but essentially, the last characteristic here is they seek for a sense of accomplishment. Um, they want to know that they are fabulous. <laughs> And I think I'm a millennial that way too. Like, <laughs> just tell me I'm fabulous, please. Someone help Sarah's me. Sarah's fabulous. I need it's true. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. We we want to be told that we're fabulous all the time. But are we fabulous all the time? No, we're not fabulous all the time. Um, so. Uh, in line with this, also millennials have a very low tolerance for inauthenticity and they want immediate feedback and they want it now. I'm sure you guys have noticed that in their course. They want to hear from you when they send you an email. They want to hear with you from you within 30 minutes. Otherwise, you're glitchy. Yeah. You're not working. You're a broken professor. Um, so a BYUI lit example, though, that I thought was very, very unique is um, President um, Clark said BYU-Idaho was founded upon the firm belief that there are extraordinary possibilities in ordinary people. So again, that idea where the millennials maybe aren't so far off um, because they do have extraordinary capabilities. We just need to help them channel them in the right direction. Um, so I'm going to go and breeze through these because there's one in particular um, that I want to make sure that I touch on for sure. Um, things that I do are things like screencast shout outs, um, student spotlights, giving praise, avoiding inauthenticity. Okay, when you have a m class full of millennials, really, really, really try hard to steer clear of templates they can spot a template from a mile away. Um, they just know. And they value feedback probably above all else. Discussion boards and feedback are the things that they want the most from you. They want interaction with you. They want to know what you're thinking of them. They want to know how they can improve. They want to know how they um, can be success successful. And those templates, they can spot them. And it basically takes away your ethos or your ethics with them if they spot that you're giving them a template because they don't feel like it's personalized or real. I want to share with you something, um, a video. Yeah. Um, let me give you some context for this video. And don't even, like, every time I do these screencasts, they, like, freeze on my face in the ugliest face I could possibly be making. Like, <laughs> see what I'm talking about? It's like it's a conspiracy. I'm not even kidding you. Every time. And I hate seeing myself on video. But last semester, I was so frustrated. <coughs> this was probably one of the most unmotivated classes that I've ever had. I tried every trick in the book. I mean, I felt like I was up there dancing. <laughs> I was like, guys, I love you. Do your work, please. <laughs> and they just were not responding. So I actually said a prayer, probably for the first time ever, about my students, where I said, Heavenly Father, this isn't working. Like, I have a lot of experience, and I got nothing. I'm coming up dry. I need to reach these students. I want them to be successful. Literally, the still small voice came to me and said, make a screencast. And I thought, I'm already making screencasts. I'm making tons of screencasts. I'm exhausted. And it said, make a screencast where you just tell them something good they're doing. I was like, what? So what I do with my feedback now is I still give them their grade that they deserve, even if it's a 68%, which sometimes it is. I still include my track change document where their paper gets slaughtered, <laughs> unfortunately, where I'm telling them this is a problem, off focus, off topic, what the heck, I don't say that. <laughs> but you know, stuff like that. So they get their, their feedback so they know that they need to improve, they get their grade. But after all of that, 
I spend 30 seconds where I put myself on camera, which I hate. It's like the biggest sacrifice for me ever to put myself on camera. And I just tell them one thing that I thought was fabulous. So let me just show you really quickly what I do. Hey there, Brad. So there's lots of things that I liked about this essay, as you can probably tell from the grade, but I'd have to say that my favorite thing, the thing that I think is going to serve you very, very well on your upcoming persuasive paper that you're working on is the fact that you were supporting the arguments you were making, the things you were saying um, with actual quotes from scriptures or general authorities, things like that. And the integration of your quotes, a lot of times students, students tend to struggle with the integration of those quotes, making sure they're properly framed or used um, effectively, meaning not too much, not too little, um, using partials and combining it with sentences um, partway through. So a lot of students tend to struggle with that, but you did not. You did absolutely phenomenal with your quote integration, um, which made me so, so happy. So thanks. Keep up the good work. Okay, I use a software where I can see how many students are viewing this. And my feedback went up to them viewing my screencasts up to like about 90% of my students are viewing them. I've got tons of emails last semester. Even had one student go so far as to download the software that I used, put herself on camera, and send me something back saying, I can tell you're a real person, that you care about me. I want you to see that I'm a real person and that I care about you and what you've done. It's made a huge difference. And I've continued on with it. People are showing it to their kids, their grandkids, because it's giving them what President Gilbert asked us to do that feeling of belief that they can do something, that they're important, that they're special, that they have capacity. So that was the biggest game changer for me. We're out of time. I'm sorry, but there it is. All right. Just in closing, we want to show you and give just a little, sorry, I don't know which way I'm pointing it. <coughs> a little bit of a um, spiritual perspective on this. I love the term that shows up in scripture all the time, um, nations, kindreds, tongues. This comes from, um, this particular scripture comes from Alma 29. This is verse eight. It says, the Lord doth grant unto all nations of their own nation and tongue. That's a slightly different um, use of the words. But I had a very wise religion professor one time who asked us, do you think tongue just means language? Do you think it means that you're going to receive revelation in English because you speak English? He pointed out that maybe tongue is broader than that. Maybe it refers to culture or idioms or regional references. He pointed out how the Savior taught differently when he was talking to poor farmers using parables that they would relate to as when he was talking to the Pharisees and using specific types of argumentation. The Lord talks to us in terms that we understand. And if he's the master teacher and we want to emulate that, then maybe rather than shaking our fist at these darn kids, maybe we need to come to them where they are and help lift them from that. Thank you very much.